Let's use this opportunity to take bold investments in American industry and innovation so the future is made in America, all in America. When the federal government spends taxpayers' money, we should use it to buy American products and support American jobs. It's a plan that uh, is very radical left, but he said the right things because he's copying what I've done. But the difference is he can't do it. President Trump, Joe Biden sparring on the economy, one of the areas where President Trump still holds an advantage over Joe Biden. Let's talk about the race now on our roundtable. Joined by Chris Christie, Rahm Emanuel, Amanda Carpenter, former top staffer for Republican Senators Ted Cruz and Jim DeMint, now political columnist at The Bulwark, and Zerlina Maxwell, senior director of progressive programming for Sirius XM, author of The End of White Politics. Welcome to all of you. And Rahm, let me begin with you. Joe Biden has about a nine-point lead in national polls right now leading in all the battleground states. And that has some Democrats now talking about going into Georgia, going into Texas. Is that overconfidence? Uh, yes and no. I think on the straight point, I always think what you have right now, don't get confused with the national polls. They are very, very good. But while he is, uh, the pr vice president is up in the battleground states, I would right now, number one goal, secure those top battleground states before you expand the field. Keep your eye on those opportunities that uh, approach. And I think that right now, I wouldn't spike the ball on the 20-yard line. We know what happened in 2016. Focus right now on securing Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Florida, the, and North Carolina. That's what I would do. And then look strategically about which of those opportunities. Right now, you have an election, George, where the American people basically want a president who solves problems and not be the source of problems. And that's the opportunity Democrats have right now. And, and Donald Trump, until he changes that scenario, is he is seen as the source of problems. And Joe Biden is a secure, smooth choice. And nothing that has changed that dynamics, if it doesn't change, Joe Biden's in a good position and the Democrats are in a very good position. Chris Christie, the big problem for the president right now, we just did a poll with Ipsos on Friday showing the two big crises the country is facing right now, the COVID crisis and the crisis in race relations. 67% of the public disapproves of how the president is handling those. Until he turns that around, he can't be in this race. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, George, but I will tell you that it's never good as an incumbent to have crises going on during the time you're running for re-election. And so that's a pretty simple understanding in, a, in, in anybody who's been involved in national politics. But I think what the president needs to do, and he started to do it a bit this week, is to start to talk about what he wants to do with the next four years. Right now, Joe Biden is laying out an agenda that's being unchallenged. I think if the president challenges that agenda with a right of center agenda for the next four years, then you turn this into a binary election rather than a referendum on the president. And then this becomes a very competitive race. I think as Ron pointed out, um, the vice president is ahead in many of the battleground states, but he's not ahead by nearly as much as the national polls are showing. Um, and I think what the president needs to do is to lay out his vision for the next four years. We don't need to look backwards. We need to look forwards. And I think if you start to do that, you can change the, the tenor of the debate in the country. And that's what the president needs to do. And Zerlina Maxwell, one of the things we did see from Vice President Biden this week is that his first real major economic speech of the general election campaign, where he tried to take it to President Trump. Go ahead, Zerlina. Yes. Uh Yes, George. Um, Vice President Biden put out a robust economic plan, and that plan demonstrates that he does have a vision to help the most marginalized people. I think that the contrast uh, that Mayor Rahm was talking, Mayor Emanuel is talking about, is important to highlight because Joe Biden needs to set forth a vision. He's going to be coming in potentially in the middle of this COVID crisis, and also uh, with voters concerned about how that vaccine potentially would be distributed. And so my Signal Boost co-host on SiriusXM always says, we're voting for a vaccine delivery system. And I think that paints a very visual picture for people about what is at stake in this election. And so I don't think we should look back or forward. I think we should be very present in this moment and deal with the public health crisis, which is intrinsically linked with the economic crisis. And Amanda Carpenter, that is the big hope for the president and his supporters right now, that a vaccine is developed relatively quickly before the end of this year, that we, we continue to see a, a, an improvement in the economic situation so you have real growth in the third quarter. Will that be enough? 
Uh, that's the hope. I mean, where this race really started to get away from Trump was last spring with the uh, three events that happened. You had the protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. You had the pandemic. And then you had the nomination of Joe Biden, who a lot of Republican independent voters said, you know what, maybe I can live with that. And so they can jockey over, you know, who's the economic populist. That seems like some consultant driven, you know, stuff that doesn't matter. What matters is whether America is open again or not. And you look at the coronavirus crisis. Families have been dealing with this since past March, April, months and months. And you look at this administration, and it's like they woke up in July and said, oh, yeah, what about schools? Families are worried about this. And the plan coming from them is essentially, we're going to mandate that you open up. We don't know how you do it, but figure out or we're going to take away your funding. You know who that's going to hurt them with? Women, who he's already suffering with. Uh, suburban women ran to the arms of Democrats in the midterm elections. And Donald Trump's last stronghold is non-college educated, mostly white, rural women. In the last ABC News poll that looked at that in June, he had an 11-point slide. If he loses them even further, he has no chance of winning the election. George. Chris, Chris, he pick up yeah. Rahm and then Chris on, on this point. I, I just think there should be two points added here. One is you have a situation, Biden, the vice president laid out an agenda that was economic that kept both wings of the party together and actually also provided an uneasy target for the president. The president called it both stupid and copping him. Only Trump could say that about another plan. Number two, right now, if you look at all the polling and focus groups, the country feels that we're driving 70 miles an hour around the turn at the dark of night on wet pavement, and the person at the steering wheel has a driving permit. And unless, and that, the president, there is nothing that says at this moment, let's do four more years of this. Elections are either change or stay the course, and right now, change is beating stay the course by 15 points. Let me bring that to Chris. I mean, one of the things you talk about the president having to lay out a second term agenda, he started to do that a little bit with Sean Hannity this week. But pick up on the points made by both Amanda and Rom right there. Before he even gets to that, doesn't he have to do more to reach out, particularly to these suburban women who seem to have been turned off by how the whole coronavirus crisis has been managed? Well, George, laying out a vision for the next four years is what will do that. Um, I don't, whether you're a suburban woman, um, an urban man, um, whether you're, you're someone who has children who are wondering whether they're going to go back to school this fall, or whether you're someone who's still unemployed, what you want to know is what's going to happen next. I disagree with Serlina on this. We don't need to focus on the here and now. We do have to look at the horizon and focus on the future and lay out a plan. And here's the problem for Vice President Biden on this point. He it still refuses, with the exception of one speech this week, to get out there and really start to talk about things. This is a strategy by his campaign and by the Democratic Party. They don't want him out there because, as we've seen also, there have been some really concerning videos that have been put out recently um, of the vice president struggling with articulating his vision, struggling with answering direct questions. And that gives us a preview for what I think will be the most important presidential debates since 1980. Because there was real uncertainty, you'll remember, about Ronald Reagan in 1980. Was he up to the job? Was he ready for the job against an incumbent who was having difficulties? That was a very close race until that debate in 1980, when Ronald Reagan assured people, reassured them, that he was going to be okay as president of the United States. That race turned into a blowout. Joe Biden's going to have the same opportunity, but the same risk. If Reagan hadn't performed well in 80, that race probably would have gone to Carter. And so I think the debates are going to be something, because Biden's hidden so much, that are going to be even more important this time than they were at any time in recent memory. Ms. Erlina, does Biden have to get out more right now? His campaign seems to think what's going the way he's campaigning now is working for them. I certainly think that they are uh, being cautious in this particular moment and only strategically putting the vice president into spaces where he can be effective. What I do think their strategy uh, will, would help their strategy in this particular moment is if they use a robust list of surrogates and influencers in social media spaces to get the message out about the vice president's plan. He's not the only messenger for the message, George. And I think it's really important to understand that we are presently in in the middle of a crisis. So just to push back on the point that we shouldn't talk about the here and now, there are 136,000 Americans dead right now, and that number is only rising 
at a moment where it seems the administration is not on the same page with all the governors in terms of the one federal policy uh, that dictates what everybody should be doing to keep everyone safe. Because, um, George, this, this is a country where we all are a part of maintaining the health and security of all Americans. And that's something to keep in mind. And Joe Biden is a good messenger for that. But there are other folks, surrogates and influencers, who can go out and directly speak to those younger and more diverse communities that he definitely needs to turn out in November. Amanda Carpenter, the vice president's chief hey, surgeon, George, is going to be the person. George, it's George. Go just, ahead, Chris, and then let me go to Amanda. George, I, I just want to say that's not what I said. I, I don't think I did not say we shouldn't talk about the here and now. Um, what I said was, if you're going to be an effective candidate for re-election, you must lay out a vision for the future. And the president's talking every day, as is the administration, about the current crisis. You had Admiral Girard on um, just earlier in the show laying out their strategy on testing and what they continue to do. And I would say one other thing in response to what Zerlina said. Um, putting the vice president in places where he can be most effective. Um, let me tell you something. That's not the way the presidency works, George. You know it, and I know it, and Rom knows it. You get put into the presidency. You can't be put into some place where you're most effective. You have to show during a campaign you can deal with the stress and the strain and the difficulty of the job. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, that they have to show the American people, because I think that's where they're going to be concerned when their vote comes in November. And, Amanda, the, everyone will be scrutinizing the vice president's choice for a running mate uh, as well. A lot of talk this week about Rahm's fellow, for, his senator from Illinois, Tammy Duckworth. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, it's sort of interesting. It seems like the strategy from the Republicans is to sort of force Biden out of hiding. And I think Chris Christie would agree with that from what he said. But all they're trying to do, all Trump is trying to do is force people back into these petty political fights. And I think <clears> a lot of Americans have had enough of that. And what makes uh, Tammy Duckworth appealing to a lot of people right now is that she got poked. She got poked by Tucker Carlson, and she said, you know what, I'm not going to take this, and then I can put him back in his place. Sure. And George, so, make... you know, how much are we going to get into that kind of fight? I don't think people want to see that. People are out of work. Their kids can't go to school. And Donald Trump, we don't need to see the future because we have a past to judge on. So if this is going to be a referendum, which it should be because this has to do with leadership, and we have a record that we can look to with Donald Trump, let it be that. Rob? Yeah, I was going to say two things. Put aside the fact that the attack on Tammy Duckworth, the senator from Illinois, and the governor of Michigan, Kristen Whitmer, both reinforce the president's biggest problem right now, which is he's pushing away suburban college-educated women. In, 19, in 2012, President Obama got 46 percent of that vote. Today, George, uh, Vice President Biden is north of 60. In 2018, Democrats for Congress got 60 percent. This trend, so attacking women governors, women senators, all I can say to the Trump campaign, keep going. Don't stop. Just be yourself, because it's not going to work individually to the candidates. Vice President Biden has to do four things in the next four months. Pick the right running mate, perform at all three debates, lay out an agenda to the future that the American people can see themselves in, and make sure that he draws a stark contrast. And the reason Chris is acting the way he is both times in the last couple of weeks is because Biden is executing his campaign perfectly. He's laying out an agenda of the future, letting the president stand out there in the arena by himself, get, fully exposing himself to the American people that reality TV is not up to reality. And that is what's hurting President Trump because he cannot administer himself out of these three crises. Everything with Congress, going. What he has to do on his own, administer both the virus, police reform, economic recovery, he cannot w organize himself out of a wet paper bag, and he is being exposed for what he is, which is a fraud. Chris, he called you out, so you respond. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know, Ron put so many different uh, phrases in there. I don't even organize out of a wet paper bag. too complicated for you, Chris. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but, but I, you know, yeah, I, yeah, definitely, Ron. You're definitely too complicated for me, and probably for the American people, too. Here's the, here's the problem. Um, the, the problem for Rahm is he said there's four things they have to do and Biden's executing perfectly. Well, you know, he's come out of the basement once in the last few weeks. And, and I would disagree with Amanda. I'm not advocating that we get into some petty political fights with Joe Biden. Uh, what I'm advocating is that the president lay out his vision for the next four years, let Joe Biden lay his vision out for the next four years, and let the American people choose. And the only way that the president can do that is to actually lay that vision out. 
And so I, Amanda says she wants it to be a referendum. Um, there's always an element of referenda um, when you're dealing with an incumbent. But if the incumbent wants to win, the incumbent has to lay out the agenda for the next four years, contrast that with the challenger, and then counterpunch when the challenger goes too far left, which is what I think Joe Biden will do here. But, you know, we still have, uh, you know, about 115 days or so to go. Um, we're going to see whether the president can execute on that or not. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to be sure interested to watch. That is, that is one of the big questions, Sarah Lee. You know, one of the things we've been seeing, though, from the president is a focus on other issues. Of course, that Friday night commutation of Roger Stone's uh, sentence. Any sense from you that that could work for him politically? Commuting a sentence of somebody who was convicted of a crime looking into the president's conduct? No, I don't think that's going to be beneficial to the president. I think it reminds the American people that this president has been impeached. You had a Republican senator, Mitt Romney, the only senator to uh, vote for conviction, come out saying that this is unprecedented historic corruption. That's a quotable. That's something the American people understand. And to the point about the vision for the future, the current situation is going to dictate what the future looks like. If we don't get uh, the virus under control in the states currently that are experiencing spikes, I'm the daughter of a, a biologist, George. If we don't get that under control, then we are not going to be able to have much of a robust future and economic growth going forward. Because again, all of these crises are interconnected and the president has been incompetent in dealing with them. He stood up uh, in front of a podium and told people to inject disinfected, talking about putting the president in spaces where he can or cannot be effective to the governor's point. But I just wanna say that when we're talking about voters and how Joe Biden can reach out and speak to that democratic base, we're forgetting about the fact that the Democratic base in this current moment in 2020 is women of color. Black women vote six points higher than the national average. We turn out at nearly 70 percent uh, of the time in each election. And that's something that Joe Biden can focus on, that Democrats don't traditionally focus on this early in the election cycle. So invest early, message directly to communities that can turn out and tip the election in your favor, particularly in these critical battleground states like North Carolina. But don't forget Georgia, which is on the list as a state where the black vote can have a major impact. Chris Christie, there's no question the president has the right to commute Roger Stone's sentence. But was it the right thing to do? Well, I wouldn't have done it, George, uh, because I don't think that the facts that surround the Stone prosecution um, support um, the idea of any type of clemency. So I wouldn't have done it. You're right in your question. The president has the right to do it, um, but I wouldn't have done it. And Amanda Carpenter, the question is, and you saw Adam Schiff making this uh, point when he was on earlier in the program, uh, Mitt Romney uh, aside, um, and Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania uh, aside, the Republican Party has, has basically said we're okay with this. And maybe one of the reasons is the president was on Twitter this morning attacking Pat Toomey and Mitt Romney. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a serious subject, and it's not just about Roger Stone. This is a page in a whole book about how Donald Trump is replacing the rule of law with the rule of Trump. You look at serious things that have been happening. He is purging attorneys generals in important districts, the Eastern District of New York, the Southern District of New York, Washington, D.C., ousting inspectors general who try to exercise a modicum of accountability over this administration. And so where are we going to go? He's putting his lackeys, political allies, into important positions while he threatens Obama with treason and wants to go continue to go after Joe Biden. And so what happens when he turns justice inside out and he not only obstructs justice, but wields it against his political enemies? That's what I'm worried about going into November, the lack of Republicans who are willing to stand up for the rule of law are paving the way for worse things to come. And I am very worried about the time that we're going into November when Donald Trump gets desperate to preserve his power. Rahm Emanuel, it's pretty clear that the Democrats are now saying everything is about the election. There's nothing more they can do to stop these kinds of actions from the president. 
Well, I actually, I have a view on this. First of all, the Republicans are going to pay a price, George, for 100% blind loyalty, not finding any room or, or degree of differences with the president. So they're tied to him over the last three and a half years. And the next four months uh, on, in November, they're going to pay a price for that blind 100% loyalty. I actually thought when I saw the Roger Stone clemency, given everybody that disagreed with it, I actually thought it was the first indication that the president knows he's going to lose and he's settling up right now. It was the first time that you could see an action taken not to actually enhance his chances of winning because it's another controversy. He doesn't need more controversies around his candidacy and his presidency. He needs to clear them out and give people some calm and comfort. And every day, his, mo his modus operandi going back to Roy Cohn is fight, fight, fight. And right now, he's make picking the wrong fights. And that, I actually think this is the first that, time you see that he knows he is not going to win. That's going to have to be the last word. Thanks to all of you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.